Greetings, everyone. Uh, it's great to be participating with you in the 2020 Sperry Symposium at Brigham Young University. My name is J.B. Hawes. Uh, I'm in the Church History and Doctrine faculty at BYU and uh, really excited to uh, participate in this. My gratitude to the organizers, the, the symposium committee for the great work they've done, especially in unusual circumstances. And uh, thanks to all of you for tuning in wherever you are. It's a pleasure to, to talk about uh, these important things with you. Um, I, I always have to feel compelled. There's one bit of introductory material that I, I just have this compulsion to share. And that's from that I grew up in a small town called Hooper, Utah. Um, I need to share the screen so you can see how we uh, draw the map in Hooper, Utah. So uh, Hooper is uh, uh, about 80 miles north of Provo, about 40 miles north of Salt Lake. And as you can see, um, we, we think very highly of, of this place. It's on the shores of the Great Salt Lake. So it's a beautiful beachfront community. Um, let's just say that social distancing is not hard in Hooper. Uh, I live in Provo now, but uh, definitely still um, always claim Hooper. And uh, probably a lot of you are noticing that um, that uh, at first glance, you might expect this to be pronounced Hooper, but uh, we say Hooper. And um, so we kindly correct people and sometimes not so kindly correct people. We just have this point of pride uh, to, to uh, let people know that it's pronounced Hooper. Um, and, you know, if you go around and you just sort of drop this in your everyday conversation, people are going to think you are natives. This is going to open doors for you. So, uh, so it, that's where I'm from is Hooper, Utah. Uh, I guess someone from Hooper is sort of used to the experience of uh, not being always well understood or, or people um, not, uh, not grasping at first glance what I'm trying to say. Um, so I want to start from this place of misunderstanding um, as we're going to talk about uh, the, the topic at hand, and that is Doctrine and Covenants theology with Eastern Orthodox terminology, um, and especially how we can seek clarity about this idea of theosis and deification. Uh, my guess is that many, many of us have had the shared experience, this feeling of frustration that comes when you do not feel like you have adequately conveyed to someone one of your deeply held religious beliefs. Um, and this feeling to me seems to be something different than honest disagreement over religious beliefs. Somehow disagreement just does not feel as frustrating as the inability to clearly express, express the belief in the first place. And I'll admit I've often felt that kind of frustration when interfaith conversations have turned to Latter-day Saint beliefs about exaltation, about humans' potential to become gods. In theological circles, this belief is also often termed theosis or deification. Theosis for Latter-day Saints lines up well with the idea of fullness in one of Joseph Smith's most remarkable revelations, which is now contained in Doctrine and Covenants 90, uh, section 93. Here's that passage. I give unto you these sayings that you may understand and know how to worship and what you worship, that you may come unto the Father in my name and in due time receive of his fullness and be glorified in me as I am in the Father. That's uh, verses 19 and 20 in Doctrine and Covenants 93. But Doctrine and Covenants 93 is certainly not alone among the Doctrine and Covenants passages in pointing readers in the direction of deification. Um, we have section 76, section 84, section 88, section 132, all proclaim a similar witness that the ultimate end of the saving work of Jesus Christ is an invitation to share fully in the divine life to experience theosis. Theosis, simply put, is at the heart of the Latter-day Saint plan of salvation. It always go, almost goes without saying, though, that while many Latter-day Saints find theosis to be ennobling and awe-inspiring, many other Christians find it to be off-putting and blasphemous. Two cases in point, um, after all, this was the heresy that fueled The Godmakers, the film from the early 1980s that was uh, put, forward, uh, put out by the group Ex-Mormons for Jesus. And even the recent Book of Mormon musical um, takes some similar satirical shots. Uh, in, in one of the songs uh, singing about Latter-day Saints who in a future glorified state expect to become gods on their own planets. And that's where the aforementioned kind of frustration can set in, I think. For Latter-day Saints, the God Makers, the Book of Mormon musical, just feel off target in the representations of what Latter-day Saints are trying to say with theosis. Polemics and satire aside, what still feels off is the impression that becoming like God for Latter-day Saints implies replacing God or supplanting him or existing independently of him. 
what often seems most difficult to convey is the latter day, is that Latter Day Saints affirm and perhaps counterintuitively both the doctrine's boldness and breathtaking scope on the one hand, and its simultaneous call for humility and tentativeness on the other. And in that spirit, this presentation here is more interested in addressing misunderstandings than in dismissing disagreements. And that's where I think the doctrine of covenants can be very, very helpful. So to cut to the chase, the key point to be made on this score is that the doctrine of covenants is emphatic, as also we'll see subsequent related commentary by Latter-day Saint prophets. The Doctrine and Covenants is emphatic that Latter-day Saints, for, that for Theosis in, for Latter-day Saints does not mean a supplanting of God or a detachment from God or an existence independent of God. Theosis is understood by Latter-day Saints is an act of divine grace. Analogies can often be helpful when coming at concepts that are difficult to communicate in and of themselves. And it is painfully apparent to Latter-day Saints that theosis is a concept that is difficult to communicate. This paper therefore proposes that a comparative lens can be helpful in bringing things into proper focus. There is a potential benefit in turning first by analogy to another Christian tradition, Eastern Orthodoxy, that has also felt itself maligned and often misunderstood for its belief about theosis. Taking this analogy as our starting point, might then imbue some key Doctrine and Covenants passages with new significance and might help Latter-day Saints find what Richard Bushman, the great Latter-day Saint historian said, the right words to express our faith, to make ourselves intelligible to listeners. So that's what we're aiming at for our, our few minutes together. I think the analogy makes the most sense when we first appreciate how Eastern Orthodox Christians see themselves as distinct from their Western Christian counterparts. The East-West split in Christianity, in Christianity was already well underway in terms of philosophical approach and theological emphasis and even language, Greek in the East, Latin in the West, long before the ecclesiastical split of 1054 when reciprocal excommunications irredeemably widened the growing rift between Rome and Constantinople that was already opening over issues like the procession of the Holy Ghost and the primacy of the Pope in Rome eminent Orthodox scholar and uh, Bishop uh, Callistos Ware, he put it this way um, when he said, in the West it is usual to think of Roman Catholicism and Protestantism as opposite extremes, but to an Orthodox, they appear as two sides of the same coin. Uh, Orthodoxy in that view is a different coin altogether. One key distinguishing feature in Eastern Christianity has been the Orthodox emphasis on theosis, which has been called, uh, pull up this slide, a, a continuous golden thread running throughout the centuries of Orthodoxy's ancient theological tapestry. Or another historian called it the chief idea of all of Eastern theology was the idea of deification. Get this back. I'm just working on with the slides there. While the boldness of Orthodox teaching on theosis, even in especially contemporary teachings, has been a source of surprise for a number of Western Christian commentators, since Western and Christian, East, sorry, since Western and Eastern Christianity grew up largely apart from each other, it's only been in the last few decades that Christians in the West and Latter Day Saints included have discovered or rediscovered both modern Orthodox thought and the writings of early Christian fathers on theosis. Um, Orthodoxy has been called the forgotten family of Christianity. And I think that's especially true uh, in the United States. And part of that is geography. Uh, so Eastern Orthodoxy today is the second largest communion of Christians after Roman Catholicism. Uh, and, and it consists of four ancient patriarchates and then a number of autocephalous or self-governing um, national churches. And I think because of that geographic uh, reality and also because in the United States, it's, uh, the Orthodoxy often has been viewed as an immigrant church and, and, and an ethnic church, uh, it, it, it does seem to be for many of us the forgotten family uh, or an unknown branch of Christianity. And that's what I think makes discovering Orthodoxy's teachings about, um, about theosis both exciting and for some startling. Uh, many Western Christian authors start their treatises on deification by relating anecdotes about just how strange this sounds to their ears. That was what a scholar named Daniel Clendenin said. 
or patristics scholar Norman Russell, he, he said this uh, sort of wry comment, it is becoming less necessary in the English speaking world to apologize for the doctrine of deification. At one time it was regarded as highly esoteric if it was admitted to be Christian at all. Another typical case comes in the preface of David Litwa's 2013 book, Becoming Divine. Litwa describes a, a Protestant seminary colleague's reaction when the colleague first read Litwa's manuscript with its frequent quotations from Orthodox writers who spoke of humans becoming gods. The colleague circled passage after passage in red pen and scribbled in the margins with question marks and exclamation points. What does this mean? His colleague repeatedly asked. Uh, but not so for Latter-day Saints. These statements do not sound foreign. They sound like home. So here are two brief snapshots that uh, I think illustrate that. In my classes at BYU, I uh, sometimes put the following quotation on the screen and then ask my students to guess who said it. So here's the quotation. In the Holy Scriptures, where God himself speaks, we read of a unique call directed to us. God speaks to us human beings clearly and directly. I said, you are God, sons of the Most High, all of you. Do we hear that voice? Do we understand the meaning of this calling? In other words, we are each destined to become a God, to be like God himself, to be united with him. This is the purpose of life, that you be a participant, a sharer in the nature of God, to become just like God, a true God. BRU students do not even hesitate to offer guesses like Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, Lorenzo Snow, or, or another leader of the church. They are always taken aback, however, when they first find out that uh, this actually comes from uh, the writings of a 20th century Greek Orthodox theologian, Christophoro Stavropoulos. Okay, here's a second snapshot. A couple of years ago, a very articulate Orthodox priest who had had rel relatively little exposure to the Latter-day Saint tradition lectured at BYU's religion faculty, talking about Orthodox beliefs about humans and their potential. In the audience that day was an evangelical Christian pastor who had participated in a number of Latter-day Saint evangelical interfaith dialogues. When the Orthodox priest finished his lecture, the first comment came from the evangelical pastor. He said, whoa, you sound like a Mormon. The look on the faces of both the pastor and the priest spoke volumes. Neither quite expected what they had just experienced. Simply put, surprise is a common reaction when it comes to conversations about theosis. And indeed, in both of these examples, surprise was a central element, although for different reasons. For Latter-day Saints, encountering Orthodox writings on theosis brings the pleasant surprise of the familiar. We didn't know other Christians spoke this way. But for many other Western Christians, frankly, uh, encountering Orthodox writings on theosis seems to bring the surprise of the unfamiliar and even the suspect. We didn't know other Christians spoke this way. So it's probably only natural that Latter-day Saints get excited when they read Orthodox authors on this topic. Uh, maybe it's akin to going to watch your national team play at another national team stadium. You're always relieved to discover a large contingent of your team supporters walking in at the same time, even if they come from another city. And when it comes to defending theosis, the worldwide Orthodox community is just such a contingent, several hundred million strong. But I also think it's more than a safety in numbers issue. While there are a number of areas in which Latter-day Saints and Eastern Orthodox differ in their understanding of theosis, the similarities may also provide Latter-day Saints a sense of theological legitimacy. Latter-day Saint views of deification developed independently of Eastern Orthodoxy. Joseph Smith and his successors, like many patristic writers, wove this doctrinal tapestry with threads of biblical phrases again and again. But when Latter-day Saints discover that this ancient Eastern church tradition, this self-described guardian of the apostolic faith, has deification as the chief idea of all of its theology, it provides a sense of affirmation. I think it can lend credence to the idea that deification is a legitimate way to understand the biblical witness of salvation. But of course, not everyone has agreed that it is a legitimate way to understand the biblical witness of salvation. Over the centuries of Christian history, Eastern theologians and mystics have been denounced as heretics or as pantheists or as polytheists for their beliefs in theosis. It is in his defense against just such charges that one key 14th century Orthodox thinker, Gregory Palamas, presented the ideas that form the key component of the analogy at hand. What Gregory Palamas did was highlight two categories that are crucial for latter, for sorry, crucial for orthodoxy's theosis theology, divine essence and divine energies. In his usage, usage, divine essence signifies that aspect or quality or nature of godhood which deified humans will never adopt or assume, and divine energies signifies that aspect or quality of, of godhood in which deified humans can fully participate. 
to explore the utility of these categories for Latter-day Saints, I think we first must understand how they figure into orthodoxy. These are not categories that are easily defined, especially since orthodox theology often takes an apophatic or a negative theology approach to such questions, acknowledging what cannot be said about God or attributed to God more often than what can definitively be said. Uh, Latter-day Saint thought typically moves in the opposite direction, and that is often what causes discomfort for other Christians. More on that later. But orthodox teachings about theosis start from the place of God's otherness, and that otherness calls for a sacred respect of mystery and transcendence. In orthodox belief, just as in traditional Catholic and Protestant belief, the three persons of the Trinity are wholly distinct from creation. That is, their shared nature or essence is uncreatedness. There is an unbridgeable gap, a gap of being or ontology between cre create, creator and creature. No matter how fully divinized all saved humans become, humans will never cross that gap of essence. God alone will be the uncreated other. Humans will always be essentially different. Christos Yunaris uh, explains the orthodox understanding that schematically, this is his quote, Yunaris' quote, schematically God is a nature and three persons, man is a nature and innumerable persons. God is consubstantial and in three hypostases, man is consubstantial and in innumerable hypostases. And that's the end of the quote. So maybe one way we can think about this is essence can be characterized as that nature which for the Trinity is divinity and that nature which for humans is humanity. But Orthodox writers are repeatedly emphatic that saved humans can enjoy all of the divine energies, the attributes and activities of godliness, so much so that one Orthodox writer spoke of deified humans being equal with God. That is a succinct summation in the Orthodox view of the remarkable degree to which humans can be invited to participate in the divine life. It's worth reading uh, this quote on the screen from Gregory Palamas. Listen to the Eastern Father Maximus. Having explained as far as possible the way in which deified men are united to God, a union akin to that of the soul and the body, so that the whole man should be entirely deified, divinized by the grace of the incarnate God, he concludes, he remains entirely man by nature in his soul and body and becomes entirely God in his soul and body through grace and through the divine radiance of the blessed glory which, with which he is made entirely resplendent. Here's one more sort of summary statement by a, a, a contemporary theologian, uh, Georgios Mansaridis, and he was summarizing Gregory Palamas. The deified man is made God in all things, but he neither is identified with the divine essence nor shares it. Orthodox Christians treat these terms, essence and energies, with a sophistication and a precision that aren't found in Latter-day Saint thought. The terms themselves are not even part of the Latter-day Saint uh, vocabulary. And crucially, Latter-day Saints do not hold that God is wholly other in terms of essence or nature. What I want to suggest, however, is that there might be an explanatory utility in these two orthodox categories for bringing clarity to questions about Latter-day Saint doctrine on deification, what that doctrine is, and maybe most especially what it is not. That is, there may be more practically functionally, functionally to this essence energies distinction in Latter-day Saint thinking than meets the eye. This distinction seems especially clear in a number of key passages in the Doctrine and Covenants that emphasize that Latter-day Saints, like Orthodox Christians, believe theosis comes by the grace of Jesus Christ, and only by grace. In other words, in the Doctrine and Covenants framing of this, there will always be a uniqueness about God, even when humans are deified. God and his Son, Jesus Christ, are doing the making equal. God is the deifier. And that vision of things, I think, can change everything about how we view Jesus Christ as Savior and how we view our relationship to him and his Father. So all the full foregoing, of course, prompts a key question, an inescapable question. To what extent do Latter-day Saints and Orthodox Christians mean the same things when they talk about human deification? That is obviously a big question, one that generates different responses based on whom you ask. Most of the responses from outside observers have been dismissive on the viability of such comparisons. Generally speaking, the argument goes, Latter-day Saint conceptions of the nature of God are so radically different as to make Latter-day Saint ideas of deification also radically different. Latter-day Saints, the sense is, believe humans will become what God is. While not downplaying the radical difference in beliefs about the nature of God in these two traditions, I do think it's worth revisiting that second assumption about becoming what God is. 
the opening lines of Norman Russell's seminal book on deification in the writings of early church fathers seems apt here. Here's what uh, Professor Russell said, quote, all the earlier patri patristic writers who referred to deification, although sometimes conscious of the boldness of their language, took it for granted that their readers understood what they meant, unquote. So if Latter-day Saints have likewise taken it for granted that others will understand what they mean when they speak of deification, well, the Book of Mormon musical or the Godmakers film are jarring reminders that such is not always the case. It seems that too many comparative conversations about Latter-day Saint and or Eastern Orthodox teachings on theosis start and stop at the level of the divine essence with some reference to Parley P. Pratt's formulation or some variation of it that God, humans, and angels are of the same species. For many Christians, and even for some Latter-day Saints, the, the rhetorical question becomes, what else is there to talk about? But I think the conversation sh shouldn't stop there because the richness of the doctor, doctrine and covenants on this topic challenges easy assumptions and easy dismissals. What I wanna propose is that despite crucial differences in their theological starting points, both Orthodox Christians and Latter-day Saints are doing something similar in asserting that a robust view of theosis does not, of necessity, diminish the grandeur of God. So what can the Doctrine and Covenants teach us about this notion of a divine essence, uh, sort of an analog in Latter-day Saints cosmology? In Gregory Palamas's hands, this essence formulation reminds readers that no matter how complete deification will be, how completely divinized humans will eventually become, there still is something about God that will always be essentially different. My contention here is that the Doctrine and Covenants makes an analogous point. Before getting to that point, though, it is worth repeating that I do not make this argument to downplay the real differences between the Latter-day Saint belief system and that of historic, traditional, creedal Christianity. Latter-day Saints hold to a conception of a corporeal Godhead, Godhead wherein each person of the Trinity is a tangible personage, a discrete and material individual who nevertheless is infinitely united in purpose and thought with the other persons of the Trinity. Latter-day Saints also reject creation ex nihilo. On one level, Latter-day Saints can agree with other Christians that God is uncreated, but they also believe that in some way too, so are humans, that some criminal of human existence referred to broadly as intelligence is co-eternal with God, and thus God is not wholly other. Indeed, the May 1833 revelation to Joseph Smith that is now Doctrine and Covenants 93 contains these startling lines. Ye were also in the beginning with the Father. Man was also in the beginning with God. Intelligence or the light of truth was not created or made, neither indeed can be. The elements are eternal. That's Doctrine and Covenants 93, verses 23, 29, and 33. This is one of the remarkable contributions of the Doctrine and Covenants. It presents a radically new cosmology. And one of Joseph Smith's most moving extrapolations of the implications of this doctrine of co-eternality came in his King Follett sermon where he envisioned God this way. I might with boldness proclaim from the housetops that God never had the power to create the spirit of man at all. God himself could not create himself. Now on the PowerPoint the screen. Intelligence is eternal and exists upon a self-existent principle. It is a spirit from age to age and there is no creation about it. All the minds and spirits that God ever sent into the world are susceptible of enlargement. The first principles of man are self-existent with God. And here's, I think, a key part. God himself, finding he was in the midst of spirits and glory because he was more intelligent, saw proper to institute laws whereby the rest could have a privilege to advance like himself. The relationship we have with God places us in a situation to advance in knowledge. He has power to institute laws to instruct the weaker intelligences that they may be exalted with himself so that they might have one glory upon another and all that knowledge, power, glory, and intelligence which is requisite in order to save them in the world of spirits. This is good doctrine, it tastes good. I can taste the principles of eternal life and so can you. Well, let's face it, this is a wholly distinct cosmology and we must not downplay that difference uh, between Latter-day Saint and Orthodox Christian conceptions of God and the universe. But if that is where the conversation stops, then I think misunderstandings about what Latter-day Saints really believe about human deification will persist. This radical Christian version of materialism, that was what the philosopher Stephen Webb called it, has to be part of every discussion about the place deification holds in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The one byproduct of this Latter-day Saint anthropology is that I think it can obscure the God-human gap that is present in Latter-day Saint theology. That gap, of course, is not as wide, not as absolute as the ontological gap that is the starting point for Christian Trinitarian thinking. 
But in Latter-day Saint theology, there is nevertheless an emphasis on a gap, especially in Latter-day Saint theology of the past few decades, perhaps to a degree that many would find surprising. One way to approach this is to draw from expansive Doctrine and Covenants passages about intelligence and about light. Divine light, we learn in the Doctrine and Covenants, fills the immensity of space. It is the law by which all things are governed and it giveth life to all things. That's Doctrine and Covenants 88. We also learn about the universal accessibility of light. The spirit giveth light to every man that cometh into the world. This initial extension of divine grace is uh, an initial gift. That's Doctrine and Covenants 84. He that receiveth light and continueth in God receiveth more light, and that light groweth brighter and brighter until the perfect day. That's Doctrine and Covenants 50. This concept of light with all of its Doctrine and Covenants synonyms, truth, glory, intelligence, law, the word of the Lord, spirit, these synonyms and this idea of light become a powerful way, a beautiful way of thinking ultimately about the aim of the atonement of Jesus Christ. If your eye be single to my glory, your whole body shall be filled with light. And there shall be no darkness in you, and that body which is filled with light comprehendeth all things. Back to Darn Covenants 88. That phrase, comprehendeth all things, also appears just two dozen verses earlier in describing him who sitteth upon the throne and governeth and executeth all things. He comprehendeth all things, and all things are by him and of him, even God forever and ever. Okay, I think the parallel phrasings are no accident. What they indicate, what the whole of the Doctrine and Covenants indicates is that the why of the atonement of Jesus Christ is ultimately theosis, deification, becoming like God. That same revelation, Doctrine and Covenants 88, puts the matter in these remarkable terms in a context of eschatological and soteriological culmination. Here's that verse. And again, another angel shall sound his trump, which is the seventh angel, saying, it is finished, it is finished. The Lamb of God hath overcome and trodden the winepress alone, even the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God. And then shall the angels be crowned with the glory of his might, and the saints shall be filled with his glory and receive their inheritance and be made equal with him. That's verses 106 and 107 of Dr. Covenants 88. Being made equal with the Lamb of God is the point. The atonement of Jesus Christ makes little sense in the cosmology of the Doctrine and Covenants without that admittedly breathtaking end in mind. But when we're thinking about being made equal, a crucial cross-reference cross uh, must be made here. An earlier revelation, this is now Doctrine and Covenants 76, used the same language about being made equal. Here's Doctrine and Covenants 76. This is verses 94 and 95. They who dwell in his, meaning God the Father's presence, are the church of the firstborn, and he makes them equal in power and in might and in dominion. Significantly, we've got to keep emphasizing this, God is doing the making equal. And I think this is the humility mentioned earlier that the Doctrine and Covenants calls for, despite all the expansiveness about human potential. The language of the Doctrine and Covenants strongly implies a qualitative distinction, perpetually so, between God and deified humanity. It is a distinction of dependence. We must remember that this same revelation, Doctrine and Covenants 76, one of Joseph Smith's earliest revelations on deification, declares that saved and exalted humans are gods, yea, even the sons of God. But also that, quote, all things are theirs, and they are Christ's, and Christ is God's. That's verses 58 and 59 in Doctrine and Covenants 76. That order signals something important, I think, about relationship, about indebtedness, about reliance. And it's telling to see how this scriptural passage was used in an early 20th century joint statement of the Church's First Presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. The statement called the Father and the Son and issued by Joseph F. Smith and his fellow apostles in 1916 reminded Latter-day Saints that though exalted humans be gods, they are still subject to Jesus Christ as their father in this exalted relationship. And so we read in the paragraph uh, following the above quotation, and they, be quote, they quote Doctrine and Covenants 76, 59, and they, exalted humans, are Christ's, and Christ is God's. The assertion that gods, deified humans, will still be subject to Jesus Christ is a point that must not be overlooked and one that echoes ideas in Joseph Smith's revelations. A similar signal came through clearly in a 1984 general conference address by Elder Boyd K. Packer. And it's apparent that he was mindful of all the controversy that was swirling around Latter-day Saints of claims about exaltation as he said this in the early 80s. The Father is the one true God. This thing is certain. No one will ever ascend above him. 
No one will ever replace him, nor will anything ever change the relationship that we, his literal offspring, have with him. He is Elohim, the Father. He is God. Of him there is only one. We revere our Father and our God. We worship him. Well, one proposal here is that it is in this very emphasis on God's fatherhood and on Jesus Christ's saving role that the essence energy distinction might have the most relevance and resonance in Latter-day Saint doctrine. Latter-day Saints, of course, take very literally the words of Jesus Christ when he told Mary that God was his father and your father, or of Paul, who called God the father of all. Again, admittedly, Latter-day Saints' view of this literal parent-child relationship depart from classical theism's creator-creature formulation in ways that make many other Christians uncomfortable. But for Latter-day Saints, this parent-child relationship is the very reason that each person has the potential for deification. Put another way, it is because we are children of God that we can be joint heirs with Christ, thinking of Romans 8. Thus, while this literal offspring idea might offend traditional Christian sensibilities for Latter-day Saints, God's enduring fatherhood and supremacy and Jesus Christ's enduring salvific role resonate with the orthodox understanding that humans become gods by grace and with the understanding that there is something persistently unique about God. It is thus worth highlighting the words, no one will ever, in Elder Packer's statement. In the mid-1990s, Church President Gordon B. Hinckley sounded a note from the same refrain explaining that this lofty concept in no way diminishes God, the Eternal Father. He is the, all, the, he is the Almighty. He is the creator and governor of the universe. He is the greatest of all and will always be so. But then President Hinckley went on to say, but just as any earthly father wishes for his sons and daughters every success in life, so I believe our Father in heaven wishes for his children that they might approach him in stature and stand beside him resplendent in godly strength and wisdom. I love this. I love President Hinckley's language, and I think it seems compatible with another analogy here. Think of a hyperbola, a curve that infinitely approaches an asymptote or boundary line but never crosses it. For all intents and purposes, the curve, as it is projected toward infinity, is practically equal to the asymptote, yet there will always be a difference. By its very mathematical definition, the asymptote and hyperbolic curve cannot be identical. President Hinckley's approach him in stature formulation makes us think that maybe using this metaphor of a hyperbola and its asymptotes might be a way to think about deification, a metaphor that's present in other Christian systems, and that this metaphor does not do injustice to Latter-day Saint beliefs. Of course, the crux here is in defining the asymptote line, that axis, God, that is infinitely approached by the curve, deified humans, but never crossed. For Orthodox Christians, the asymptote is the divine essence. God will, quote, fulfill the mystical act of man's theosis. Uh, this is Paniotis Crestu, a Greek Orthodox theologian, by making man like himself in all ways except the divine essence. Well, words that might approximate, approximate or point at the divine essence in orthodoxy, words, words like, words like e eternal uncreatedness or eternal otherness are not part of the vocabulary of Latter-day Saints. That's worth stressing again. But engaging Latter-day Saint thinking in that same definition exercise can be productive in proposing words to capture what is in Latter-day Saint understanding God's perpetual defining distinctiveness, what might be the asymptote. Perhaps words like eternal worshipability, eternal fatherhood, eternal supremacy, eternal irreplaceability. I think this is the conceptual utility of the essence energies terminology in comparative conversations like this one, conversations that try to get at just what Latter-day Saints mean when they say humans can become gods and perhaps more significantly what they do not mean. So I think this brings us to a few concluding caveats and here are two that I think are, are important. Recent Latter-day Saint leaders and official publications seem to be recommending more caution and circumspection to church members when describing just what we know about the look and shape of a deified life. For one example of how this tentativeness has been manifest in church publications, it's, it's worth looking at the changes in successive editions of the Gospel Principles Manual in that book's chapter 47 um, on exaltation. In editions prior to the 2009 edition, this is the wording for what is exaltation. Quote, if we prove faithful to the Lord, we will live in the highest degree of the celestial kingdom of heaven. We will become exalted just like our heavenly father. Those who receive exaltation will have their righteous family members with them and will be able to have spirit children also. These spirit children will have the same relationship to them as we do to our heavenly father. However, in the 2009 edition, this is the parallel passage under the same question, same chapter, what is exaltation? Quote, if we prove faithful to the Lord, we will live in the highest degree of the celestial kingdom of heaven. We will become exalted to live with our heavenly father and eternal families. 
Those who receive exaltation will be united eternally with their righteous family members and will be able to have eternal increase. Notice some significant absences. The absence of the specific language of just like our Heavenly Father or same relationship in the 2009 edition. This tentativeness on the precise meaning of human deification, though, does not mean that Latter-day Saints are pulling back from enthusiastic embrace of the idea of human deification. And we can't say that strongly enough, not at all. In a January 2020 devotional uh, at BYU, Elder Ronald A. Rasband said, you have the capacity to become gods and goddesses in a realm that promises light and goodness and peace everlasting. With the straightforwardness of statements like that, uh, what should we make then of the tentativeness on display in places like the Gospel Principles Manual? For one thing, it does seem that church leaders and members have sensed the need to contextualize and qualify their statements about theosis, given all of the potential for misunderstanding discussed earlier. A key example of this kind of contextualization and qualification is an officially produced church gospel topics essay called Becoming My God. That essay includes long passages of Joseph Smith's crowning King Follett sermon that we quoted earlier and references to early Christian luminaries like Clement and Basil and Dionysius as well as the discussion of Church President Lorenzo Snow's off-sided couplet, as man now is, God once was, as God now is, man may be. The essay then goes on to say, uh, little has been revealed about the first half of this couplet, and consequently little is taught. When asked about this topic, Church President Gordon B. Hinckley told a reporter in 1997, that gets into some pretty deep theology that we don't know very much about. When asked about the belief in div humans' divine potential, President Hinckley responded, well, as man, God is, man may become. We believe in eternal progression very strongly. In other words, and I, I think this is a key point, it seems that Latter-day Saints are now trying to convey something of their own apophatic approach to this. We are saying, here is what exaltation, exaltation does not mean about God or about us. In the spirit of Elder Packer and President Hinckley, no one will ascend above him. He will always be our God and our Father. Jesus will always be our Savior. The second caveat is that this is not only a recent phenomenon, though, even if the tone and the emphasis in these statements do reflect recent paradigm shifts. And that is why I think attention to the Doctrine and Covenants on this point is crucial. While Latter-day Saints and their leaders have often felt free in the past to speculate about the wonders of eternity, the asymptotic view of the God-human relationship in Latter-day Saint thought has been simultaneously present from the beginning, even if it has not always been foregrounded in the Latter-day Saint discourse. A point that must be emphasized, and strongly so, is that the clearest exposition in Latter-day Saint scripture of just how expansive the church's view of deified humans really is comes in Doctrine and Covenants 132, the revelation about the eternal nature of marriage. This section and the previous one highlights that deification is ultimately possible only for married couples. As President Russell M. Nelson has said, exaltation is a family matter. Here's what that seminal revelation teaches. Sacramentally married couples who hold their covenants, quote, shall be gods because they have no end, then shall they be gods because they have all power. That's the end of the quote. And yet, after all that expansiveness, there still is this statement only four verses later, quote, this is eternal life to know the only wise and true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. There remains a distinction. The deification of humans does not change the appropriateness of referring to God the Father as the only wise and true God. I recognize at first glance the sense that in Latter-day Saint theology, the God-human relationship is one based on a difference of degree rather than a difference of kind will simply be a non-starter for some. However, what should not be missed is that this difference in degree is apparently so profound that it will never cease to exist. What is at stake here seems to be the worshipability or worship worthiness of God in the Latter-day Saint theological worldview. Can using these orthodox and, and Ptolemite distinctions about essence and energy help in assessing that? Can this be profitably employed to emphasize that Latter-day Saints, like Orthodox Christians, do not believe that they will become the same as God if sameness is meant to imply that they will ever exist independently of him and his deifying grace, even though they, like Orthodox Christians, talk about being made equal with him? Importantly, God, whom Joseph Smith addressed in a canonized 1836 prayer as the Almighty who sits enthroned with an infinity of fullness, that's Doctrine and Covenants 10977, is always the one doing the making equal. For Latter-day Saints, God's enduring fatherhood and supremacy imply a resonance with the Orthodox understanding that humans become gods by grace and only by grace. But Orthodox writers before and since Gregory Paul must remind their readers that they should not undersell just how remarkable it is to participate in God's energies. They use language like this. 
Man's main pursuit and ultimate destiny, destiny is to become equal to God. That's Paniotis Crestu. Humans become as much a real God as Christ became a real man. The fullness of God is stamped upon man and yet without man, thereby being dissolved into God. That's Roman, Romanian theologian Dumitris Danilo. Deification is more than the achievement of moral excellence. It is a supernatural gift that transforms both mind and body, making divinity visible. That's Norman Russell. Likewise, the most recent gospel principles manual still affirms in precisely the same language as did earlier editions of the manual that exalted humans will have everything that our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ have, all power, glory, dominion, and knowledge. These are words that carry strong resonance with the divine energy's paradigm. And so I say, yes, I think these categories can be helpful in communicating clearly. So in that same vein, then, when the reading the Doctrine and Covenants with an eye to passages about deification and theosis, two things seem to stand out. And this is where we'll close. From the first years of the Restoration, there is in the revelations of the Doctrine and Covenants a repeated witness that the Savior's atoning grace can make us like him and his Father. And from the first years of the Restoration, there is in the revelations of the Doctrine and Covenants a repeated witness that we cannot do this on our own. We will always be eternally indebted to the deifying power inherent in the atonement of Jesus Christ, the Savior whom the only wise and true God hath sent to make all of this possible. I say this is what one more reason for all of us to sing with deep sincerity. I stand all amazed. Thanks so much for tuning in.